Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Communication Day 2021. A few years ago, we started this tradition of setting aside a couple of days every spring so that we could come together as a school of communication to engage in conversations about some of the most important and pressing issues of the day as they relate to our disciplines and teaching and research areas. Last year, we are all set to have about 50 panels, activities, workshops, and other events in late March when the whole world shut down because of the pandemic. During those first two weeks, everything felt very strange, overwhelming, and unfamiliar as we all retreated to our homes, closed down the campus, and tried to figure out how to move all of our classes online. As a consequence, we never got to do our awesome Communication Days events in 2020. Besides scaring and overwhelming us, those early days of the pandemic more than a year ago also ultimately made us more adaptable, resilient, and creative. They helped us to shift the focus, recast our priorities, and move our attention to other issues in a way that we hadn't really been able to do before. Then we had a very unique summer in which racial inequalities and economic disparities burst to the surface in a way that made us question even more the way we live, the way we think, the way we teach and learn. Here at the School of Communication, as we started living in this phase that we got used to calling the new normal, we also got to thinking about the ways in which our mission and our daily lives have been affected. As a result of this reflection, we created Communication Day 2021, which are now starting. We are looking at today's activities as an opportunity for us to reflect on the lessons we have learned this past year, and especially to reflect on the opportunities we all have to build a better future. I wanted to open this Communication Day 2021 afternoon of events by thanking everyone involved, involved in preparing these activities. Thank you to all the faculty who stepped forward and proposed some amazing events, as you'll see in a little bit. Thank you to the faculty who are here and who have asked their students to join us here today. Thank you to all of you, our students, who are joining us today and welcome. And a big thank you to the SOC staff, Paul, Molly, Satch, Diego, Robin, who have worked so hard to organize and promote these events. Some housekeeping items, starting with this opening panel, you'll be able to attend as many events this afternoon as your time allows you to do. They have all been built as webinars and each one has its own link. You can find all the information about the events, including the links on the site emerson.edu slash comday. You'll be able to participate and ask questions to the presenters through the Q&A and the chat features throughout the afternoon. To get us started with Calm Day today, I invited four of our SOC faculty to join me for a conversation about lessons from the pandemic and what you expect for the future. When we met to talk about this panel, we decided to keep the focus on the opportunities for the future. We will start our conversation by talking about a few of the themes that have emerged from that discussion. But first, let me introduce them to you in alphabetical order. As I introduce them, they will turn on their cameras so you can see them as well. Robin Danzak is an associate professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders, where she teaches courses in language and literacy. Robin's research focuses on bilingual writing of adolescents and adults, examining connections between language, culture, and identity. Welcome, Robin. Carol Ferrara 
is an assistant professor in the Department of Marketing Communication. Drawing upon her diverse academic and professional expertise in anthropology, diversity, pluralism, religion, education, and business, her teaching in marketing communication encourages students to explore the ways that the social sciences can be leveraged to help make marketing and business better, smarter, and more socially and environmentally responsible. Welcome, Carol. Ken Grout is an executive in residence in the Department of Communication Studies, where he teaches courses in speech communication and oral presentation of literature. In his first year as a full-time faculty member at Emerson, Ken co-authored and published an article on sexism in the, in the Academy Awards, and also revived the South Week recital, a long-standing Emerson tradition celebrating the majesty of oral expression and interpreting the, right, the written world. Welcome, Ken. Azida Hatif is an assistant professor in the Department of Journalism. She's a media researcher and award-winning instructor. Her scholarly interests focus on issues of social media as activism for underrepresented groups, gender and identity, and media systems in a global context. Welcome, Azida. So now that we are all here, the first theme of our conversation about lessons learned and opportunities for the future is boundaries. Between social distance, quarantining, working and studying from home, we have all become in some ways less location bound, especially since technology brings the world into our spaces, and in some ways more location bound. We are all stuck at home. Robin, what have we learned from that? What are some of the implications for the future in your opinion? Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I'm really happy to be serving on this panel today to open up Communication Day 2021. So the theme of boundaries, <clears throat> um, it's, you know, I feel like this is one of the many contradictions that we're experiencing based on our new normal, as you called it in your introduction, Raul. Um, in some ways, we are bound and we are experiencing more boundaries by social distancing and having to spend more time at home, having more of our interactions in an online format like this one um, does give us some limitations, right? But at the same time, having, um, having a Zoom platform, it, it invites us into each other's spaces in ways that we didn't have before. Um, rather than having a shared workspace, we're now all sharing our home spaces. Um, for example, all of my students know our dog and our cat, which they probably wouldn't if we weren't having our classes on Zoom. So that's just one example. Very good, thank you, Robin. Carol, uh, may I ask you, what are the boundaries have been created or erased by the pandemic? And how do those boundaries help to define our future? That's a great question. So like Robin, I just wanna thank everyone for being here. <clears throat> um, but so I think, one of the things I just want to want to highlight, um, I just want to tell a really quick story that, you know, a year ago, I, um, I was actually in France, and I was there for a postdoctoral research project, and I was living with my in-laws, my then four-year-old, and I was five months pregnant with my now eight-month-old. My partner had stayed here in Boston, and so it was out of the question for me to remain in France for lots of reasons. Um, and with my four-year-old, we had 12 hours to pack after his birthday party on March 15th. And we left on the very last flight out of the country as the borders, clo borders closed the next day. And so all of a sudden the boundaries between um, our family, my research um, and our other connections and networks in France suddenly became thick and entirely impossible, right? And we haven't seen any of those people since. I haven't been able to continue my research. Um, and just like those that have been imposed on our neighbors and our social connections here. 
And I still remember the panic and the chaos and the confusion of those hours packing um, with my son and, you know, who brilliantly adaptable to change and resilient and eager for adventure, stayed up with me to pack, um, got up with me a few hours later to head to the airport and was a champion at learning to wear a mask and not touching anything at our first lesson at the airport. And this is a kid who I've previously had to scold for licking the uh, poles, the handrails in the metro. Um, and I just, I just wanted to tell that quick story because I think it really signals our, you know, we, we, we're so caught up in, in how hard it is to adapt and how hard it is to change and all the, the pressures. And I think we forget that as a species, we are extremely resilient and we're extremely adaptable. Um, you know, and as, um, you know, going through the pandemic with young children is exceedingly challenging. And it's, you know, studies have shown that this burden has not fallen equally on men and women um, in terms of job loss and extra tasks and whatnot. But, you know, when I sit exhausted trying to put my little one down and I have to teach in 15 minutes and my five-year-old is, I don't even know where, um, I just, you know, there's really a silver lining in watching them grow up and adapt to these new social norms, learn new routines, unlearn routines. Um, and I think it really teaches us that the kids are gonna be all right. And when I say the kids, I mean us too. Um, and that, you know, as, as depressing as the statistics and present, um, predictions about Gen C, they're calling it, and those kids will be here in just 12 short years here at Emerson. Um, I think it's really important to recognize how strong we really are and, and the amazing things that we've been able to accomplish during this time. Um, and so I think that's really important to forefront and, and keep in mind as we move into the future. That's great. That, that's a great example. Thank you, Kara, for sharing that. Uh, Ken, uh, so the boundaries between work and life have been raised as we just discussed with both Robin's and Carol's examples. Uh, so for better or for worse, I guess, but uh, is that healthy, All, uh, the erasing the boundaries between work and life? We will need to create new boundaries in the future, in your opinion. Well, uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for, um, Dean Rice, thank you for it having us here today. This is great. Yeah, Robin and Carol, uh, what they were talking about, absolutely, I can I can echo that. And, and when we think about the boundaries between work and life and sort of what the future holds, one of the things I think sort of a boundary is, as Carol mentioned about France and sort of the idea of being able to come and go as we please. I mean, yes, we have to prepare and we have to do this and that. But I think we're actually having to rethink now about what boundaries count as boundaries. Because I don't think we, you know, we didn't used to think, oh, I can't do this because that's not available to me. And that's one of the things in the past year that we've had to kind of rethink is what we're able to do. And the other boundary around that that I think merits some focus is the boundary of time. We are a society that, uh, at least the American society, we focus very heavily on planning. You know, we're constantly reminded, focus on today, don't worry about the future because we're a society that does that. But the boundary of time, all of a sudden, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that when you think six months out, you almost have to stop yourself and go, well, I'm not sure what life's gonna be like then. So the opportunities, in the future are really about keeping our eyes open, keeping our ears open and being willing to reshape the boundaries a little bit as we go. Very good points, Cam. It kind of reminds me, uh, I did my ethnographic research work in this little village in the Amazon, this little fishing village. And I was looking at television specifically, television had been introduced about five years before. I was looking at the ways in which television was changing the life of the families and the community and the traditions, cultural traditions. One of the first things that I noticed is that television brought in a rigid schedule. If something was supposed to start at eight o'clock, it would start at eight o'clock and, uh, and end by nine o'clock because something else had to start. This was very different from the time, the tradition of time they were keeping in the village before 
a lot of the quality, a lot of the timing, that timekeeping was based on the quality of the relationship. So you're talking to somebody in the street. If the conversation is great, you keep talking and, you know, and you postpone whatever you're going to on your way to doing. And it, it was part of everything was based on the quality and every, the society was very relational. Everything was based on relationships and quality. Uh, and I wonder if in some ways there's new boundaries or this new way of looking at time and looking at how we spend our times and how we dedicate each other, uh, ourselves to tasks if now we are going to shift more into quality. So Azira, I wanted to ask you related to that and um, in what ways do you think having fewer boundaries is positive? And in what ways does it give us new opportunities for the future? Thinking about quality, for example, quality of life. Absolutely, right. So I think the pandemic has really forced us to think about how we've traditionally done things and also opened up discussions about what's been working and what hasn't been working. Um, I think it's also exposed some practices as very privileged and encouraged us to acknowledge and respond to them too. So I think about like, you know, internships and working and going to conferences, right? So many of these have become remote in the past year. I know when I think about conference going in my own work, um, a lot of these different um, gatherings have pivoted to an online format during the pandemic. And while I think absolutely there are things we miss about meeting with one another physically in the same spaces, I think what this has also done is that we've seen how much more inclusive this can be too, right? Especially for those who uh, may not travel for various reasons, right? Including lack of funding, caring for friends or family members or general physical barriers to actually traveling. And so I think the idea of always having to be in physical spaces together reinforces at times some of these inequalities. So considering how we move forward from this point, I think is really important. And I love that we're having this conversation. Um, I know in my field, we've been talking about conferences and how moving forward, the, there can be hybrid formats so that participation is not affected by these things. And that idea about quality, right, being able to engage with one another meaningfully, too. And so I think it's important for us to investigate some of these boundaries and as to why they were created so that we have a better idea about, um, you know, why they were put in place, but also who they oftentimes serve um, and who is pushed to the boundaries oftentimes uh, by some of these practices. So I think you know, the, the pandemic is a moment, again, in which you uh, mentioned, Dean Rice, to think about uh, how we can be in commun community with one another in very meaningful ways. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Very good. Excellent. So uh, shifting our focus now to connections, which is the second theme. Uh, this past year, most of our interactions uh, with each other, with other people have been mediated by technology for better or for worse again. So I'll pose a question to anyone in the group. Uh, it's a very broad question, so you can approach it whatever way you feel like you should approach it. And also the other, uh, the other people on the panel should be free to respond to or add or uh, add a, 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 another comment. So the question for anyone in the group is, how can we reimagine establishing, keeping and growing old and new connections in the future? Very broad, I know. So one thing that comes to mind, if I may, when, when I think about the, the sort of the more intimate or the sort of first layer connections in my life, my family, close friends, things like that, we've found ways to continue connecting and remain connected and you, you get creative and you, you, um, you make it work. What I'm excited about going forward is the connections we can make with people that heretofore have not been available to us from a first person vantage point that all of a sudden I can start hearing the stories connecting with people from other parts of the world that may have been available to me only in a sort of second person, one step removed narrative process. But now there's going to be some direct engagement that this kind of, this kind of technology and this kind of normalcy will accommodate. So that's one thought I have to get the ball rolling. Very good. 
Um, I also was thinking that, and this is related to connection and, and maybe also boundaries and some other things, but something that is an impact of this whole experience with the pandemic, and this is a worldwide experience, right? So it's something that is connecting us to everyone else around the entire globe, which is very unique. I mean, we don't often have events or, um, I don't know, celebration. You know, we don't often have these, these things that connect beyond boundaries <laughs> across the whole world. So all of us are connected in that way. And I feel like one of the results of this whole process has been growing our awareness of our kind of collective life. Very abstract, generally speaking, that how we participate, how we choose to participate or not to participate in certain activities and certain um, events, how that affects other people around us, people who are strangers, people who might live down the street or live on the other side of the world, right? So, um, so kind of that more abstract sense of connection and a global kind of universal sense of connection. I feel like that's something that has um, been strengthened by this experience. Yeah, I think to follow up from Robin's point, I feel like I've attended way more birthdays and graduations than I ever have uh, because I'm able to do so through Zoom. So I think there are interesting ways in which, you know, through physical disconnections, we've also allowed for some more intimate social connections too. Um, and so I think the pandemic, of course, is forcing us to think creatively about how we connect to one another too and how it is that we conduct our work as well. Uh, throughout the pandemic, when I think about, you know, the, the field that I'm in and uh, the department here at Emerson Journalism, um, we've also been thinking Thinking about how uh, journalism's role throughout this process too, and how it is that the public has relied heavily upon journalists to um, understand what's going on and also provide that critical information. So for example, what are shelter in place orders that are taking effect in my town? Where are local food pantries and so on, right? And so I think journalists have responded to some of these challenges in doing their work, which often would contribute to disconnections and come up with creative ways to connect with one another and also to build communities too. And I think it's also really highlighted for us the importance importance of especially local journalism and not only providing uh, that sense of community, but also critical information as well. Um, and of course, there are real concerns about, you know, the future of uh, local journalism, which of course is uh, another part of the conversation. But I think it's really important to see the value in what it is that we all uh, need right now. Um, and I think another point that, uh, you know, Dean Race, you had also mentioned and kind of thought that I started thinking about this in terms of how we're rethinking some of our work and these connections. Um, I know in my ethnic graphic work, I, I had to rethink some different methods with connecting with participants and interlocutors, right? It's difficult to sit next to someone and watch, observe them watching TV as I would in the past, right? So um, how it is that, you know, some of these things have been lost, but could this be an opportunity for us to reimagine different methods too, to engage with communities as well? Yeah, that kind of leads me to the, to the second part of that question exactly is, uh, what has been lost to the pandemic in terms of connections and how can we recreate, regain, or even better, reimagine what has been lost and make it better? So I just, I might, I might take us a little bit into our next theme in, in, in my answer here. Yeah. Um, but I, I think what's really important to recognize as we reimagine the ways that we're connecting to one another and re reimagining everything, right? Reimagining re what we think about when we think about what we should do when we get up and do our daily routines in our lives um, and think about how we're adapting. I think there's a really enormous opportunity here um, for positive social change. And so as we're, as we're thinking forward to how we are reconnecting and reimagining these connections, I think it's really important that we, um, that we don't miss this opportunity because there's been, um, you know, all of the major social change movements have come out of a particular set of circumstances, um, socio-political circumstances in the past, um, you know, and 
just to I'm moving, I'm moving right into social justice here. Um, you know, George Floyd was not the first black man to be killed by police and he was not the last. Um, but again, social change is about circumstances and, you know, inching the boulder up the hill or even pushing it over in momentous, you know, moments. Um, Rosa Parks was not the first black woman to be arrested for not giving up her seat on the bus, but the socio-political circumstances around her arrest is what gave way to her being the linchpin to, um, to a future of, of social change. And, um, you know, similar to the LGBTQ plus rights that dates back at least a half a century, if not more, um, but there's been an unprecedented shift in US public opinion, a positive shift um, towards acceptance in the past 30 years because of certain circumstances um, and simultaneous shifts and turbulence in the, in the socio-political client climate. Um, and I think it's really important that we, that we don't lose sight of those, um, of those really important issues and sort of think about how we can embed um, social justice and social change in our daily thinking as we rethink this, let's embed it in everything we do in our mission and our values and our teaching, um, you know, in our classes um, so that we, so that we don't lose sight of this opportunity and we don't lose that, um, that chance that we have right now. Very good. So as Carol just alluded to, uh, social justice uh, is the, the next theme that we want to talk about. However, uh, there are two or three uh, really interesting comments and questions in the Q&A. The first one from Estelle uh, Tickting from CSD, uh, talking about boundaries. One that, has, uh, that was highlighted this year is the disparity in access to technology. So if this has torn down some boundaries to participation due to distance, it has also shown that a serious effort is needed as a country to expand the access to technology and internet access, uh, which I think leads us to the issue of social justice too, how the pandemic and there, were, there was something this summer about staying at home that really, uh, let us pay more attention to the world and what was going on around us, to that eruption of, uh, you know, when disparities became so evident uh, with attacks like the George Floyd uh, death that uh, Carol just referred to. So uh, also those uh, disparities in technology really will dictate the way we live if we are so dependent on technology for connections. Uh, as we saw in, uh, in terms of work and learning and teaching and uh, how is that access, uh, their impairment in terms of the disparity going to affect uh, the way we uh, move forward. Does anybody want to refer to that or uh, it's, a, it's another big question, you know, how this uh, access is unequal, basically. If I could just sort of open that, um, yeah, access is unequal. And it's quite frankly, uh, a travesty. I mean, in this country, there should be a sort of universality of access, in my opinion, regardless of geography and regardless of uh, fiscal availability. It's, it, it strikes me as something that is woeful when there are people in certain parts of the country who, for whom internet access is limited if available at all. But the other thing that we've got to keep in mind, I find is a sensibility about when we use the technology, and this goes directly back to what Robin said as her opening comment, talking about the boundaries and yet the intimacy that comes from, I mean, you are right now in my home, as am I in yours. For some people, that's that's not a very tenable or a very um, positive thing to have happen. We're all in these lovely spaces and we sort of have these uh, spaces to ourselves at the moment, but there are people that they can't do that. They're on camera and they're in a place they're not proud of, or they're unable to get uh, appropriate space. So when we think about the sort of accessibility to me, it's an issue about technology, yes, but it's also an issue to consider people's uh, unique situations and having some sensitivities around that, so. Yeah, I'd also like to chime in with a perspective from the field of communication sciences and disorders and thinking about 
accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, for example, uh, in, in our training of students who are working to become speech language pathologists, we've had to really make use of teletherapy, which is something that's existed for many years, for decades in speech language pathology and is something that's been very effective in, for example, spread out rural communities where people don't have the ability to get to a speech language pathologist. Um, and having our students train in this area is possibly increasing accessibility and their ability to work with people who might not be able to come to a clinic or a site or an office, right? Um, but at the same time, we saw that closing down public schools really impacted kids with disabilities because children who go to public school, children who have disabilities are attending school and are really, they and their families are really dependent on getting the services that they receive every day in school. So um, closing down schools put a huge burden on those students and their families. Very good. Uh, we, we have another question here from Bamati, uh, one of our colleagues in the marketing communication department. And she's asking, basically, she's talking about the over-reliance on technology, which is something that bothered her already before the pandemic, the way people were over, overly dependent on their iPhones, for example, they couldn't really focus on each other for conversations. And uh, so she's kind of concerned uh, about how to manage, how do we teach uh, or how do we work with students and others and people on our life, in our lives, like kids and grandkids, uh, in terms of how to manage that space and time and that over-reliance on technology. So I guess it's the downside if the, if the pandemic opened this new door to have people from across the globe guest lecture in your class all of a sudden, it also brought back the spotlight into over-reliance on technology. Uh, and, you know, considering all the access issues we just discussed, that's another one, you know, uh, what happens to people who don't have the access. But are we going to become over-reliant on technology? So, so this is something I actually, we talk about a lot in, in really all of my classes. And um, I think what's really important is to recognize that even if we don't, um, we don't have all the answers in terms of how to solve these problems, I think one of the most important things we can do for our students is raise that awareness. Um, so we read a lot about the addiction of, of social media and how it, you know, works with our dopamine systems in our brains that, um, you know, so, so that students are aware of what's happening to them when they use social media. Um, and it's something I think about in, you know, once I'm, a, once you're aware of it, you can't be unaware of it. So every time you pick up your phone, you start to, you know, think, okay, well, did I, do I really want to do this right now? Is this going to make me feel better? Um, and giving students those tools to at least recognize, even, even if we can't, um, convince them, right, to let go of their Instagram accounts and whatnot. That might, that's not the goal, right? We want to stay connected um, with everyone. It's given us all of these um, privileges to be able to, to cross boundaries and whatnot and new ways of communication. So I think the most important thing is just to learn responsibility. Um, and I also, as an anthropologist, I have a little bit of hope that once we are allowed to sort of see each other again um, in, a, in a full kind of way, if, if that day comes, um, I think actually we might be a little bit more persuaded to put down our phones. So I'm hoping. I'm hopeful too, uh, the, which kind of, I'm, I'm sorry, Rick, Ken, did, did you? No, I was just going to add to what Carol was saying. It, there is, there is this sort of difference between over-reliance and pure and simple manners. I mean, we go back to the issue of boundaries and this, these kinds of, these kinds of questions have come up before, albeit in perhaps less dramatic fashion, but I, you know, I, I remember being in the house as a teenager, my mother, when it was time for dinner, you didn't answer the phone. And voicemail and answering machines didn't exist. And if somebody answered the phone, it was her. And she would tell whoever was on the other end of the phone why we couldn't come to the phone right then. It would, there was a standard of behavior that was sort of, you know, drilled into people. And I think one of the things that happens with technology is sometimes technology elevates so quickly that the standard is a little bit slow in catching up. 
But I think to Carol's point, if we just continue to reinforce and we draw appropriate boundaries and we pass those things on, I think it starts to, I think it starts to take shape. I think it's also, you know, just to follow up on these points, it's a moment in which it's um, it's requiring us to reflect and really reckon on some of these different practices too. And I think sometimes we can fall into like techno utopian or dystopian debates very easily, but I think there's great nuance in these conversations. Yes, social media can be weaponized by bad actors, but I think there's also important ways in which we think about how it fosters human connection too. Um, and if I may, I, you know, we are talking a little bit about accessibility and I think some things that kind of came up for me in this conversation, we're also thinking about it from the perspective of journalism of who gets to tell stories, right? Um, and I think that's uh, something that I just want to bring into our conversation and thinking about how there's a reckoning very uh, rightfully so taking place within newsrooms across the country, but also within journalism education about how we cover topics of race, gender, sexuality, more broadly marginality, right? How it is that some long held beliefs are being challenged and rightfully so. Um, and so I think, you know, there are often times in which you can see see some practices being weaponized and wielded um, in ways that further cause harm to people. And so I think what we are seeing right now is that um, it's not the first time we're having conversations around things like objectivity, right? Um, these debates will continue uh, on and on. Uh, but I think what becomes really important for us to ask is and, and really reflect upon is that um, are we encouraging ourselves to reimagine journalism in a way that truly serves all people? Um, and really getting into these points about accessibility and these boundaries and how specific practices have long harmed a lot of communities and how we've reached this moment and the pandemic gives us that opportunity, right? As Carol was mentioning, to really think about things in a new way and think big about them too. Thank you, Wazira. And I would extend that to the other three panelists as a question in terms of looking at your disciplines. And you can look at your disciplines or you can look broad, you know, broadly into, into the issue. But when we talk about social justice, how do we reimagine the future, what we teach, what we practice, how we live, so that equity and social justice play a much bigger part in it? I think Azira started to talk about how in journalism, newsrooms are changing and voices are being heard that haven't been heard before. What about the other disciplines in communication? Well, we are absolutely reimagining in CSD. And I, I think the thing is that, you know, we have, there have been undercurrents and, and movements because there's this awareness that the profession of communication sciences and disorders is very homogeneous in terms of who is working in the field, right? And it, it's primarily women who are white. And so for as long as I've been in the field, there have been conversations about how do we become more diverse to better serve the communities that we're serving? Because we as a field are not representative of the diversity in our communities. Um, but I, I think that the events of the last year have really served as a great, um, a great push to just really start to take action. Like we've been talking about this for decades, but things really have to change. And and yeah, I, I would I would say it's been positive because even here at Emerson, you know, even in our department, we've had um, a lot of great conversations. We've had we have had students. Um, get very involved and wanting to participate and contribute to these conversations and contribute to how we can move forward. Also teaching our new generation of students, right, to be more inclusive, to be more um, culturally aware, um, practice cultural humility and cultural agility, learning to really be self-reflective of our own biases and our own cultural lens. So these are things that um, I feel like finally <laughs> as a field um, are becoming more mainstream, which is great. Carol, I, I know that you have some comments about uh, social, social responsibility and uh, I, I assume maybe related to business or um, yeah, so I think um, in you know in the domain of marketing, um, 
you know, we've, we've been reading in, in my classes, The Hype Machine, a book by Simon Arl from um, MIT. And he says that we're all digital marketers um, in this digital, in this, you know, in the world of social media, which I think is a really dominant um, force in our lives today. Um, and I, I think what's important to recognize is that, um, you know, there's a lot of brands right now, for example, that are standing up for, um, for social justice and for environmental justice. And um, that's important to recognize. And, you know, the boardrooms of these, of certain companies are still not diverse enough. Um, and I think as consumers, you know, so those of you who are in the marketing business, for sure, it's really important to think about who's on your team, who's coming up with these marketing campaigns, um, you know, who didn't say something to the Burger King um, ad creators who launched the um, Women Belong in the Kitchen campaign the other day? You know, who was whose voice was not recognized there, and represented? Um, because it's it's it is still happening. But then, you know, on the other side, the um, the change makers are there too. The brands that are really standing up for social justice. And I think, you know, as consumers, we need to think about how we encourage that. Um, and try and do good due diligence in our research in terms of who we purchase from, um, because at the end of the day, it's these it's these companies, it's corporations that are increasingly shaping our ethical futures, um, and so it's really important that we are investing in that ethical future as consumers um, and as marketers, being aware of how we are um, leveraging the enormous power of marketing and media in order to help shape and reshape the narratives. Um, about a lot of these issues. Very good. Carol, there is a question here. What is the name of the book? Is it The Hype Machine? It, it is. I can put it in the chat, perhaps. Yeah. And Ken, there is also a question comment for you. Uh, maybe you can address that now. But in terms of uh, what you said about having the sensitivity, might we want to take a step further and by having a strategy? In other words, how can we better disrupt ableism in communication to improve connections for all, um, you know, it's some. Um, it's a big question. It's uh, kind of a food for thought. Well, and it's a lot of food, and I'll tell you. Um, and the reality is, yes, I think, I think there needs to be a strategy. I think the people who need to be on the front line, perhaps, of developing or considering that strategy, are the people that might, in fact, be compromised by the lack of a strategy. And, and so it, it is the people whose, whose lives are being um, stretched to the, to the point of, to a difficult point that they need to be involved in developing. How can we, how can we, uh, how can we go about making this, making this better and making this improved? I think strategy is key. I'm just not sure that the development of the strategy can take sort of the same old form. Yeah. That's a good point. Before we tackle our last uh, theme for the day, I, I want to bring up another really good comment here from Rebecca. And uh, she says, one of the things I really fear is that once things reopen, we will lose all the lessons and all the flexibility that we gained from this time. So what are some of the ways you think we can keep these changes and not go back to normal? Well, I think about it even in terms of like teaching, uh, the pandemic had forced me to kind of really reflect upon some of the things that I just naturally put into my syllabus um, and, and thinking about, you know, the flexibility that's required and that I'd like to see through even past the pandemic. Things like, you know, uh, flexibility when with due dates and having an honest conversation about what deadlines mean too, right? Um, and I think it also um, requires us to kind of reflect upon how it is that uh, we think about things that have just traditionally be done because that's the way we do things and how this is also uh, forcing us to reimagine that too. And I think it kind of connects back to the, the question and the theme that we were talking about a little bit earlier. And I know from my perspective in journalism, we've been thinking about how we can reimagine education in the industry for some time. And I think the compounding pandemics have really um, further exposed some of the structural issues and also accelerated some of the problems that have existed for a while, um, especially when we think about it within journalism too. Uh, some of the structural issues. And so I think this is a moment in which we can uh, think big and allow that flexibility to also be incorporated in a lot of the work that we do moving forward as well. 
Yeah, and I, 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 I agree with that 100%. And I think also looking at education, kind of broadly speaking, there is no way we can go back to just doing things the way we did before. There is just no way. I think there are a lot of positive lessons that we learn that we can start applying. There's new uh, sensitivity that has been heightened in terms of the way people live and the access they have to things. And uh, that is an unequal access and the, the way they learn is different too. And uh, what are some of the lessons in terms of having this hybrid model that we can take to our daily lives and the daily way, the way that we uh, educate and we learn and we teach. Uh, so there are many different ways I think in which the, the genie is out of the bottle and there is no way we can put it back. Uh, we will have to look at the world in a completely different way. I don't think it's gonna happen overnight, I, but it's, it's a great indication here that we are thinking about the future that we are having this conversation. We obviously have been thinking about this and we wanna get the, whatever silver lining we had out of the situation, we wanna be able to learn and employ uh, in our daily lives and also in the way we teach and the way we learn and the way we educate and the way uh, we work. Uh, so the last question, as I said, the last theme is around media and social media, which in some ways media and social media permeate uh, how we live. Uh, in this case, permeates what we teach and also what we do and uh, how we communicate. So what are the ways in which we can reimagine journalism, communication, media, business, social media going forward? Uh, again, a big question. I won't pretend that we'll come up with all the answers. I know you've been thinking about that. So when it comes to what we do and how we teach, uh, what are some of the ways in which we can employ those lessons? So I'll just make make two quick comments. First, um, just to speak back to Rebecca's concern and to thinking forward, um, you know, there's a great saying by the Greek philosopher um, Heraclitus uh, that you can never step in the same river twice. And he lived centuries ago, and that was the case then. It's the case now. And so, no matter what, we are never. There is no normal, right? We have a lot of nostalgia for for the past a lot of times, but. It's never even, it's an imagined past, right? It's what we hold on to in terms of our memories. And so I think the important thing is to think about um, is you know, changing the narratives to be what we want for the future. And social media can play a really important um, role in that. We need to be aware of the fact that um, you know, fake news spreads six times faster than, than real news. Um, we need to help our students be um, really media literate and understanding the implicit bias that that gets worked into all kinds of news, right? There is no such thing as unbiased anything. Um, and we have to, to make our students hyper aware of that in order to be able to juggle um, all of the, you know, everything that gets thrown at them on social media um, and learn how to use it responsibly. Again, you know, really understanding what's at stake in the, in the social media game um, and the inner functionings of all, and even if we don't have the answers, even if they don't have the answers of who, um, who should be responsible for, you know, who should be the arbiters of truth on, on Facebook and um, whatnot, we need to have the conversations, even if we don't have the answers. I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I think we need to start with ourselves, you know, start with, and we're talking about how we can, thinking about how we can be models for our students, but also thinking about our own practices and in our daily lives and how we can positive, positively contribute to this kind of collective whole that, that I mentioned before. Um, how can we ourselves, each individual, um, reflect on our own biases, our own um, support how, how we could potentially be supporting inequities or um, providing access or barriers to the people in our own lives and in our communities. So um, yeah, I would say that reflective process for each one of us. And for me, I'll just throw in this quick last thought and let us need to finish it up. Um, 
social media has become this sort of uh, potpourri of information and fact and opinion and negativity and positivity and personal and worldwide. And it's become this mishmash of things. And it's not necessarily that we're ever gonna be able to tease out, well, this is that and this is the other. But it's helping, I think, as both Carol and Robin alluded to, it's helping our students and helping ourselves remember that we are looking at this, that this uh, globe containing a number of factions and to not sort of, not sort of tag it as one thing, social media, and have that have that be a determining factor going forward. I think it's important that we understand what it is as well as what it's not. Yeah, and I think just to um, continue on with what's been said here too, I think it's important that we identify, as Carol mentioned again, you know, how misinformation and disinformation make its way through online spaces, especially in times of heightened uncertainty, as we saw throughout the pandemic where people are looking for answers. I think we can see that this is an incredible opportunity for us to really focus on media literacy. And I think there are also other parts of the conversation that are important to include as far as, you know, Oftentimes voices that are silenced or unheard really find a place in these online spaces to be heard too. And I think that's a really important part of our conversation as well. Excellent. And uh, I, I want to thank the panelists. But before we go, I just wanted to highlight that at one o'clock, we have three great panels coming up and they will be dealing with these issues. Uh, one, we'll be talking about local news and what has changed. It's a national panel of journalists, it will be really interesting. The other one in terms of storytelling with smartphones, talking about the power of media and social media, you can tell stories that haven't been told uh, by using you know, uh, social media and the, your phones and technology. And the other one about case studies and confirmation bias and digital culture, so we can learn more about how the, the case of fake news, as I think Carol said, or somebody else, it's six times more spread more easily than real facts. Uh, we can talk about confirmation bias and how that operates in digital culture to, uh, that people reproduce what they are hearing just because it confirms their own biases without questioning if it's true or not. But this has been an amazing panel. I think it was the perfect way to open this afternoon of conversations. We touched on a lot of different issues. I know that we didn't exhaust all the possibilities and all the different uh, positive ways of reimagining and recreating the future. But I have to thank all of you uh, for your time and for your insight and your wisdom and your expertise. And I really appreciate it. And I think everybody who attended the panel really appreciates that. So thank you so much. It was really nice uh, to be here this afternoon discussing these issues with you. I'll see you all soon. And thank, thank you everybody you. for attending. Thank you.